Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Dr. Becker. Father, thank you for everyone that's here tonight. And I pray, Lord, truly that your Holy Spirit will come and prepare our hearts. Because, Lord, we didn't come for some social gathering tonight. We didn't come just because this is what people do on Sunday nights. Lord, we came because we want to have a fresh encounter with the living God. We want to hear from you tonight. So, Holy Spirit, come and prepare our hearts to receive every bit of the powerful living word that you have for us tonight. Let it come into our hearts and do the work that is needed in every heart. And Lord, while we're praying, I pray for each and every one of our service members. There are some of them out there on the field right now. Some of them maybe even in harm's way. And we pray for your protection around each and every one of them, Lord. We pray that you watch over each and every one of them. Bring them back to their families, Father. That is our heart's cry to you tonight. As a congregation, we stand in the gap for them tonight, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for each and every one that has given, that have sacrificed so that we can live in a country that is free. So thank you for each and every one of them. Thank you also for what you're about to do in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody say amen. 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 Tonight, since it is Memorial Day weekend and everybody is thinking about remembering, I'm going to start out with a scripture that will help you to understand why I'm going to talk to you about this subject that I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk to you about godly relationships. And I want to take you to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It says, yes, I think it is right. As long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you. When I told my wife, this is what I'm talking about, she said, you already preached about that. I said, that's okay, that's, that's no problem. Um, this is really what God has put in my heart. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to remind again because, you know, if something is important enough, then we have to go back to it. Amen. Just like Memorial Weekend. God doesn't want us to just forget. He wants us to be reminded about stuff. That's why there's certain feasts that... You know, we, we have to remind ourselves about stuff. Otherwise, we will forget. But listen, um, I should have been dead 28 years ago. For those of you that know my testimony, I was burnt with fire, and, and the devil wanted to take me out. I was burnt with 75% of my body was burnt. And so I shouldn't even be here tonight with you. But hey, listen, as long as I'm in, I'm in this tent... I am going to stir you up by reminding you about something that is very important to God. Is that okay with you? Yes. And that is called godly relationships. You see, um, when we think in terms of relationships, as a matter of fact, this year, Pastor Dan, Pastor Luke, they have already told us you know, this is the year where we're going to focus on learning how to love more. Isn't that true? And we need to be reminded about that. We're also going to learn how to do church better. But, but I'm going to focus on the first part, loving people more. And, um, and I'm going to stir you up about that tonight. Secondly, the reason why I'm bringing this to you is because this is the third pillar of the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Did you know that? Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe you need to go out in the foyer and remind yourself, what is the seven pillars that we have here at the Rock Church? Because those are the things that we hold very dear to us, that we feel are very important. And the third one is called godly relationships. God does, God's desire is for us to have godly relationships in our lives. Amen? Amen? 
How many of you know that's not so easy? Uh, there's about two of you that agree with me. Hey, this, this is a tough cookie, like some people would say. How many of you have ever made a mess of relationships? Anybody? I tell you, I've been married now uh, 32 years, and uh, I'm still struggling to get it right. It's still uh, tough, and sometimes she's the one that stirs things. Did you know that? Like just before service, she came, and she had water in her hands. I have uh, witnesses. Pastor Paul was there, and uh, Pastor Joel, and she threw it all over my hair and just did this with my hair. That's that woman, and I have to live with her. So, hey, it's not always easy to have godly relationships. Sometimes you, you get riled up in the, in, in, on the inside. And uh, you want to say things, you want to do things that are just not so godly. Am I right? And so I, I, I want us to talk about that. How can we do better when it comes to uh, godly relationship? How can we grow in this area of godly relationship? This morning, how many of you were here this morning? Wow, what a great message this morning Pastor Luke brought. That was amazing. I mean, Pastor Luke taught us about giving and about tithing. And, and he said that um, giving or tithing is a test, right? It's a test. I want to tell you, relationships, <laughs> they will test you. If you ever talk about a test... That's also a test, especially to see if it is a godly relationship or if it's just a worldly relationship. God wants us to grow in godly relationships. That's God's desire. And by the way, you know what? When it comes to uh, loving people more, I think this week we have really done it as a church. Do you remember what happened this week? See those banners up there? We had that uh, pastor's gathering with over 500 pastors here. Wow, that was so amazing. You guys, you rocked. You were um, enabling us to be able to love these pastors, to encourage them, to lift them up. It's because of you guys that we were able to do that. So why don't you give yourself a hand for loving pastors more this week right here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. That's what you guys did. So point at somebody, tell them, you're amazing. You're amazing. You may not have been here to help volunteer, but even so, just being part of this family because we did it, you were part of it. Amen? And so that's what it takes. God wants us to love more. And how do we do just that? How do we grow in godly relationships? The first thing, if we want to grow in godly relationships, we have to connect with God. There's no way you can ever have godly relationships without you connecting with God first. He is the only one that can help you to become the person that God wants you to become. 1 John 4, 19 says, we love him because he, he did what? He first loved us. Because he loved us, now we are enabled. Now we are filled up so that we can also love in a way that is godly. But without God and his love for us, oh, praise God for his love for us. Without his love for us, we'll be nothing. And we will be stumbling all over the place in relationships. We will hurt more than we would uh, help anybody. And so God's desire is for us to understand that um, love really is about learning how he loved us. John 3, 16. 
God so loved the world that he did what? He did what? He did what? He gave. Now, this morning you heard a great message about giving. Giving of our finances. God wants more than that. God wants us to give of ourselves. Give of our time. Give of our talents. You know, God wants us to learn when you love, it's all about giving of yourself. As a matter of fact, Pastor Jim, his definition of real love, do you know what that is? It is the giving of yourself for the betterment of someone else. That's what real love is all about. Giving of yourself for the betterment of someone else. That's real love. And that's the heart that God wants us to have on the inside. When we become more like God and we learn from him how to love, that's what it takes to have godly relationships. You see, there's all kinds of love out there in the world. But do you know that kind of love, it just don't last? I see too much of that in my office when people come and they have So many heartaches brings tears to your eyes to think the heartache and the struggles that people have in relationships. How the devil can manage to come in and just bring such destruction, not just between a man and a woman, but between the the kids. And it's now his kids and her kids. And I mean, it's, it's just... It's heartbreaking to hear some of the stories. And many times I've seen it is because we try to love in our own strength. We try to love the way we see on television or in the movies. But let me tell you, the world's kind of love is just going to fall flat on its face every time. Unless you and I have God's kind of love on the inside of us, we'll never be able to love in a godly relationship and make a difference in this world. So we have to learn, as a matter of fact, how to love the way God teaches us how to love. And for that, you know, you can always, uh, if you want to take a test of how good you are doing, you can go to 1 Corinthians 13. Just this week, somebody sent me a letter. Man, a husband, said, Pastor, I want you to know I can't do this anymore. This is just too much for me. Talking about his marriage. This is too much. And you know what? It can get tough, right? And that's why 1 Corinthians 13, when you start reading there in verse 4, it says, love, God's love, God's kind of love, is ready to suffer. What's that word? Oh, I, I know you don't want to hear that one. It suffers how long? And, uh, and, and he's trying to say, Pastor, um, how long is long? And I have to say, you know what? Uh, I think uh, you made a vow. And you said, till death do us part. That long? Can I get a hitman around here somewhere? (laughs) This is San Bernardino. That's not the way to fix things, friend. You got to get God's kind of love on the inside of you because that's the only way you and I can Suffer long. Can go through stuff. You know, the world, I mean, mean, life can deal you a bad hand sometimes. Can I get an amen? Or is it more of an ouch? And when it does, who says God didn't entrust somebody to you for you to love to life. But you thought you were just dealt a bad hand 
or you cannot do this. Yes, you can't. But with God's love, with God's love, you can. When you have God on the inside of you, he enables you to be able to suffer long. And, and that whole 1 Corinthians 13 is like a checklist for you. When you try to see, am I doing good on uh, godly relationships or ha having godly love in my heart? Is your love kind? Does it envy? Does it parade itself? Is it puffed up? Any of those things. Does it behave rudely? You know? Um, it's easy to snap back at somebody when you hear a comment or somebody that, uh, something that somebody did and you, and you just snap at them and what comes out? Something that's not godly, right? It's easy. And it's a good test to see are you now in the flesh or are you in the spirit? You see, anytime you stay in the spirit, when you connect with God and he becomes bigger on the inside of you, that's what enables you and me to be able to not behave rudely, but behave in a way that um, doesn't seek its own, it's not provoked, think no evil. Keep going, keep going. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Last part, bears all things, believe all things, hope all things, endures all things. And then lastly, love never, what's that word? Fails. Never fails. That's what godly love says to us. And that's what God's desire is for us. So first thing, if you want to grow in this thing called Godly relationships, believe me, you're going to have to connect with God and make sure that you tap into his kind of love to enable you to become the person that God wants you to be. Secondly, you have to connect with godly people. Um, you know, um, would you know that uh, this thing called godly relationships or relationships is really what's most important to God. Did you know that? When Jesus was here on earth, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they came to Jesus. And they said to Jesus, Jesus, we have all these different laws that we have to keep. Of all these different laws, what's most important? Jesus looked at them and he said, okay, here it is. First of all, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And second of all, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, what he was saying to them, it's all about relationship. First, your relationship with God the Father. And second of all, your relationship with those around you. So if that's what's most important to God, don't you think it should be important to us? For sure. And so that's why that's the third pillar here at the rock. We want you to understand how important this is to God so that you can grow in that. And that's why we are going to enable you as best we can to grow in this thing called relationships. We'll put you in a, uh, we'll help you by getting you around other people, okay? You, you can't grow in relationship by yourself. Did you know that? I mean, you can't sit on TV, watching TV by yourself with your remote control, thinking you're going to grow, hello, in relationships. Some people think they're going to go to heaven someday, and they're going to have their own couch with their own remote control, their own TV, and that's heaven. Hello. That's so sorry to burst your bubble tonight. <laughs> heaven is about love, relationships. And so God is trying to get us ready. Hey, hey, if I wanted to teach you something, let's say I wanted to teach you how to be a great swimmer. Do you think I can give you this great book about swimming and say, okay, just read this book and you're going to be a great swimmer. Is that right? No. no. What do you have to do? You have to get in the water. 
Unless you get in the water, you'll never be a great swimmer. You may know something about swimming, but you'll never be a great swimmer. Same thing with the relationships. Unless you get around other people, you'll never learn how to become, how to grow in godly relationships. So, we're going to help you. Here at The Rock, we want to help you. Because remember, this is the third pillar. And the way we're going to help you is we're going to try to get you to be involved in ministry. That's the first thing we're going to try to do. You see, once you get around other people in the ministry and you start helping in that ministry, of course you're going to be around other people. And, uh, and uh, you know what? We're family. Does any of you have perfect family? Anybody? I mean, your blood family. They're your blood family, whether you like it or not. They're your family. You can't say, well, oh, if that person is coming to Memorial Day uh, picnic tomorrow, forget it. I'm not going. They're your blood family, right? Here in the house of God, <laughs> they're also family. It's called family because of the blood of Christ. We're brothers and sisters in Christ because of the blood of Christ. And so we have to help you to accept each other and love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so when you get around other people within that ministry, you, yeah, there will be some things that will rub you the wrong way. But isn't that where you can learn about having grace and having mercy with one another and forgive and loving kindness, all the stuff that God wants us to grow in? Isn't that where it happens? And if you don't want to get into a ministry, well, we have small groups. So I, I'm the pastor over small groups, among other things. And so it's my uh, privilege to have an audience here tonight that I can really plug small groups, okay? It's good for you. It's a good thing because it helps you to get around other people and to rub some elbows and to learn how to grow in godly relationships. That's God's desire, remember? That's what God wants. So when you get around other people, let me, let me give you some practical tips of how you grow, okay, in godly relationships. Is it okay? Can I just be practi practical with you tonight? Yeah. Why don't you put on a big smile and look at somebody and smile. Is that okay? Smile. You know, it makes a difference whether you wear a smile when you're around other people, right? Yeah. Especially in the, God, in the house of God, you have reason to smile. Amen. And it makes a difference when people look at you and they see a smile. So come on, let's learn how to smile. Secondly, let's learn how to edify. Yes. Edification means I am going to look at you the way we do here in church. You know, Pastor Jim uh, started this many years ago. He would have us point at each other and say, you look good. <laughs> Come on, let's practice that again. Point at somebody and say, say something nice to them. Can you? Tell them something nice. Wow. Now that wasn't so hard, was it? <laughs> First Thessalonians, listen, this is what the Bible says. First Thessalonians 5, 11. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another. God is speaking to us. He's, he's putting that assignment on us. We have to edify one another. The word edification means to lift each other up, to value each other. Now some of you, when somebody said something nice to you today, that was the first nice thing you've heard for the last few weeks. I know. And isn't that sad? How sad is that? That people would come to church and not hear something nice. Somebody tell them something good. 
This is God's house, and we need to learn how to grow in godly relationships, how to value each other, how to tell each other, you're amazing. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being here. Thank you for what you're doing. When you see them serve, when you see them greet, when you see them change diapers, you say, thank you. You are amazing. Because they are. In God's eyes, he loves them so much. He died for them. You see, the measure of a life. Corey Ten Boom said this one time. She said, the measure of a life is not its duration, but its donation. So if you want to have a big life, really make a difference in this world. It's not how long you've lived, how much of it you've given. When you learn how to give, when you learn how to love, and that's when you give of yourself for the betterment of someone else, now you've lived a life that was worth living. And that's what God's desire is for each and every one of us. So, you have to learn to connect with God if you want to grow in godly relationships. Secondly, you have to connect with godly people. And then thirdly, you're going to have to fight fear. How many of you know that it is fear that prevents us from having godly relationship with one another? Fear comes in because of stuff that happened in the past. And all of a sudden... I just want to protect my heart. All of a sudden, I just want to shy away from people. That's exactly what the devil wants. Where does it all come from? It comes all the way from the Garden of Eden. Remember? Wow, Adam and Eve, they had a great relationship with God. Can you imagine that kind of relationship they had with God? Wow, they could do anything. It was amazing. And then, then they screwed up. And uh, you know what? I screwed up. You screwed up. You screw up. All of us make big mistakes. In relationships, we all make mistakes. Don't point at somebody, but remind them sometimes you mess up too. Isn't that true? Yes. Wow. But you see, um, when that fear comes in, it will, it will stop us from having the relationship with each other that God wants us to have. And I want you to know all kinds of relational fears that's out there. doesn't matter what kind of relational fear it is. I want you to know that fear is not of God. Because God did not give us a spirit of fear. Yes. But God, he has given us a spirit of what? Power. Power. Love. Yes. Sound mind. That's what God has given us. Yes. Don't let the devil put that stuff on you. He would love to do that. Don't let him. Don't let him rob you of the joys and the blessings of great relationship with each other. That's exact. He's a thief. He wants to rob you. Watch out for him. Watch out for him. So any kind of, uh, um, any kind of um, fear, you have to fight against it. And the way you fight against it is with forgiveness. When we learn to forgive, that is what pulls out those roots of unforgiveness and bitterness that keeps us down, keeps us in bondage. That's exactly what the devil wants us. For the rest of your life, he wants you to have anger towards somebody. The rest of your life, you want to be uh, mad on the inside and, and you'd rather walk on the other side of the road when you see them coming. That's what he wants. 
But God showed us the example of how to forgive. And we fight those fears with forgiveness. When we learn how to forgive, that's what makes all the difference. Matthew 6 reminds us, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Keep going. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So we have no choice. We have to learn to forgive. Now, on a side note, I don't have time to go into this, but I want to tell you, forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. Okay, I want you to understand this dynamic because it's very important that you get this when it comes to relationship. You can ask for forgiveness and be forgiven in an instant, but reconciliation takes a little longer. The, the, the word reconciliation when it comes to relationships has to do with, um, with you becoming, uh, getting back into a state of harmony with one another. That's what reconciliation does. Bring you back in harmony. Harmony has to do with unity. Don't you know that God wants us to be one, especially as married couples. God wants you to be one. In harmony, in other words, right? And so um, when, when you talk about uh, reconciliation, for those of you that do finances, you do the finances in your, in your house, you know how to reconcile your statements, right? What do you do? You, you look at all of your notes of how much money you spent and how much money came in, and, and then you look at what the bank sent you, and then you reconcile those numbers with each other, right? And then you e even write an R in my, in my computer. It's a, it's a software thing that it, it does that. It put an R next to those line items that are reconciled. In other words, they've become one. They are in agreement with each other. And so God's desire for us is to walk in reconciliation. This, this is how important this is to God. Watch this. Watch this. Look at Matthew 5. Leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First. First. Everybody say first. First. first be reconciled to your brother. Then come offer your gift. This is how big this is to God. God's, God wants us. His desire for us is to live reconciled with one another, in unity with one another, in harmony with one another. That's God's desire. So we have to learn how to do that. But I tell you, when there's fear, we, we struggle to get to that level. Some people wonder, you know, how long, Pastor, does it take to... to be reconciled. How long does this process take of reconciliation? You see, I, I've had couples in my office. And, uh, and, and it's easy to, for me to help them to actually get to forgive each other. But then I know they walk right out of there and they're not reconciled yet. Their hearts are still not in unity. And I have to even teach them how they can get back to that place of reconciliation with one another, where they can be in harmony with one another. And we have to do that all the time. In other words, that's what God's desire is if we want to have godly relationships. So um, it, it depends how long. My answer to them is, how long will it take to be reconciled? It depends how long you've been out of harmony. Because it is, it's going to take work. You're going to have to work towards reconciling your differences. You're going to have to work towards, you know, fixing those things that bring conflict all the time in your relationship. And that can be with you and your kids. Could be with you and your family members. There's no harmony there. There's... There's this, butting heads. And that's not what God wants. God wants us to love one another. 
And so unless we're willing to reconcile with one another and become one, you know, we are not living in godly relationship with each other. So uh, it may take a while, but it's worth the work. It's worth working towards that. Because, listen, let me tell you, it is the most wonderful thing when you can get to that point where you can work out all the differences. And now you've come to a place that I call perfect love. John actually talked to us about that. In 1 John 4, 18, he says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. He who fears, and that's what so many relationships are struggling with, all kinds of fears. He who fears have not been made perfect in love. There is something that still has to take place. Let me give you some hope. Perfect love, you say, Pastor, that's a dream. That's impossible. I tell you, I show you, I'll show you a great example in the Bible of perfect love. Mary is a great example. Um, when, you, when you look um, in the Gospels, you see the story of Mary that came to Jesus with a, an alabaster jar with costly oil. And she took that, that was her life savings. That's everything Mary saved. That's, that was her future. That's what she was going to depend on to live for the rest of her life. Her life savings. And she took that. And she broke that alabaster jar. And she poured it out over Jesus' head. And anointed his head. With oil. This was just before Jesus was crucified. Now listen, listen to what Jesus says about this. First John four, uh, I mean Mark fourteen, verse nine. Assuredly, I say to you, this is Jesus talking. Whoever, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will always be told as a memorial to her. Wow. Here is a woman. She will always be remembered. Why? Because she has overcome fear. The fear that said, I can't let go of this. What's going to happen in my life? What will happen if I give everything I have? What will happen? My life will be destroyed. That's what fear will try to tell you. Anytime you give, fear will try to stop you and say, hey, you can do something else with this. You shouldn't do this. This is not smart. But perfect love came and drove out fear. And because she loved perfectly, she broke that jar and poured it out over the head of Jesus and anointed him with oil. Listen, isn't that amazing how you and I can get to a place where we can let go of the fears and we can be so filled with the love of God. We can so filled, be filled with a desire to please our master that we say, forget about everything. I'm going to pour out my heart. I'm going to give and give and give until there is no more to give. That's perfect love. Now there's no fear. It's just, God, I trust you. You will take care of me no matter what. And that's what God wants for all of us. Listen, my time is up, so I know there's some of you here tonight. You're sitting here and you're saying, Pastor, you don't know the kind of wounds I have in my heart. 
You don't know the hurts. You don't know the stuff that was said and done to me or my family. You have no idea. You're right. I don't. But I know somebody who does. His name is Jesus. And he is here in the house tonight. And he doesn't want you to walk around with those wounds in your heart. His desire is for you tonight to receive your healing. I'm wondering how many of you are ready for that kind of healing tonight. I see a couple of hands. There's no shame in having been hurt, okay? There's no shame here. It happened. Deep in your heart, you experience wounds on the inside of you. No shame there. It happened. <laughs> but tonight, you're not here by accident. God knows. And he wants to love you so much that he doesn't want you to walk out of here the same way that you came in. But tonight, he wants to heal you. So if you would, why don't you take a brave stand and stand right there in your seat. I want to pray for you tonight. Anybody that says, Pastor, there's some stuff in my heart that really hurt me. People have really, really hurt me. Some deep wounds in my heart. Why would you just want to sit down and not receive the healing that God has for you? Why? God loves you. He wants you to be well. He wants you to be whole and healed. Thank you for standing. Thank you for saying, devil, no more. This is it. I've had enough of struggling with this hurt in my heart. Tonight, I'm coming to the healer. Tonight, I'm going to ask him to bring healing like only he can bring. Now, I'm going to go a step further. For those of you that are sitting down, we're going we're gonna to be family tonight, okay? We're going to be family. I want you to look around and I want you to go and lay hands. Stand up and go lay hands on those that are standing because we're going to pray for each other, for each other's healing tonight. I'm going to lead us in prayer, but I want you to stand in agreement with me as you lay hands on those people that are standing. Hallelujah. Just a moment. Everybody get to those persons. Um, let's come in agreement in prayer tonight. Father, we're so grateful that we can come to you tonight. You are our healer. And tonight, thank you, Lord, that there's no wound that is hidden from your eyes. You know. You know every hurt. You've even seen the many, many tears that float. But tonight, Lord, Thank you that we can come to you for healing. Like only you can heal. You are the healing balm of Gilead. Come, Holy Spirit. You touch each and every one of those. And I took a stand tonight and said, Tonight, Lord, I came to receive my healing. In this house, the house where your healing is flowing. So thank you for your healing work right now. By your stripes, Lord Jesus, we are healed. Come on, let's say it all together. By your stripes, I am healed. Say it one more time. By your stripes, I am healed. Hallelujah. Let's give God some praise. Praise your name. Praise your name. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Bless your name. Glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah.
You may take your seat. Listen. While I'm still in this tent, I'm going to stir you up. It's my job. I got to stir you up and remind you godly relationships, how important that is to God. And the way you are going to grow in godly relationships, first, make sure you connect with God often. Do it often. Connect with other godly people. And when you see fear trying to come in, you got to fight that fear because you know that's your enemy. That enemy wants to rob you from the love that God wants you to have in your heart. Amen? Did you get something from God tonight? Now listen, before you go, I have something very important to share with you before you leave. Actually, the most important part of tonight's message is right here. Because you see, giving involves sacrifice. And Jesus gave he sacrificed. He gave it all. And there's a reason why he did it. He did it so that you will not go to hell, but that you will go to heaven. And tonight I want to talk to you about just that. I'm going to ask you a question. If this should be the last day of your life on earth, where would you open your eyes? In heaven? Or in hell? Where would you spend eternity? See, some of you think, there is no such thing, Pastor. There's no such thing as hell, heaven. Listen, you haven't read your Bible because, I mean, Jesus talks about it and very clearly in his word. It's very real. And tonight, I want to ask you if this should be your last night. Where would you open your eyes? Some of you may say, Pastor, I think, you know, I think I'll go to heaven. Because you see, I, I tried to live good, you know, I tried to do some good stuff, help people where I can. Uh, my goodness, I even brought money to the church, gave money, and um, I did all kinds of good stuff. I, I served in the, in, in the church. My parents told me I'm a Christian, you know. I grew up in a Christian home. We had a cross or a crucifix hanging on the wall. And I mean, I'm considering myself to be a Christian. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to go to heaven? Problem with that is, you know, show me in the Bible. Where anywhere in the Bible it says that just by you living good or considering yourself to be a Christian... You know, uh, doing certain things in church that that qualify you to be in heaven someday. Nowhere in the Bible do I find that. <laughs> you see, we're talking about God's heaven. The only way you and I can go to God's heaven is God's way. You can't go your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee way. We have to go there God's way. And God made it very clear to us. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one goes to the Father but by me. So the only way you and I were, are able to go to heaven someday is Jesus' way. And Jesus made it abundantly clear to us. He came to a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, talk about a great man, man that, you know, uh, tried to do all the right things that he thought was the right things to do. If you looked at the life of Nicodemus, you would say, wow, surely Nicodemus, he's a, he's a great man. And Jesus would pat him on the back and say, surely Nicodemus, don't worry, you'll be in heaven someday. But he didn't. Jesus looked at Nicodemus and he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. 
even Nicodemus that knew the scriptures. I mean, he, he uh, shared the scripture with others. He sang the scripture. He knew the scripture. Even him, he didn't understand what that meant. And so he asked Jesus, Jesus, how is that possible? How can I, a grown man, go back in my mother's womb and be born again? Still today, people make even fun when they hear about that term, born again. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter what movies tell you, or Hollywood, or anybody like that tell you about born again people. It doesn't matter. What matters is what God says. God says, you must be born again. And Jesus explained this to Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, what this means is a spiritual birth. You have to be born again spiritually. And the only way that you and I can do this is when we give God all of our heart and all of our life. It's about your heart. God is after all of your heart. He's not after what you know in your head. Most people in America would say, I know about God. I know about Jesus. My goodness, I'm celebrating Easter and Christmas every year. But it's not, listen, listen, it's not what you have in your head. It's what you've done with your heart. That's what counts. Jesus said in Revelation, he says, I'm going to come again. He, he, he warns them. He says, remember, I'm coming again. And when I come, if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You know what that term lukewarm means? It means you're just half-hearted with God. Every now and then you come to church as a token, you know, okay, you know, I'll just show people that I'm still a Christian. But you live your life any which way you want when you're around other people. My dear friend, that's called lukewarm. That's not having given God all of your heart, all of your life. Lukewarm, you know, um, token prayer every now and then. But what I'm talking about is you giving God all of your heart and all of your life so that you can be filled with the love of God, be filled with the joy and the peace that God wants you to live, uh, live in every single day of your life. That's what he has for you. And tonight's your night of salvation. So how are we going to do this? Well, let's just do it Jesus' way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you sit there and you deny me, I will deny you. This is what Jesus said. Not, a, not what I say. Jesus said that. So, what I'm going to ask you to do is in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. Just like that. And when I count three, I want you to raise your hand. Yes, wide open for everybody to see. Is there no shame in this? This is your day of victory. This is your day of salvation where you step out of uncertainty, of not being sure, of a, a day where you know you can walk out of here knowing that whatever happens in your life, you're going to go to heaven because you have decided tonight, tonight's the night you're going to give God all of your heart and all of your life. So who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, I'm talking to you. Maybe you're here tonight and you're just not sure. I'm talking to you. Tonight's your night. Why don't you make sure tonight? Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Anybody out there? One, two, thank you. Anybody else? Three, anybody else? Let me see your hand. Three people already, three wise persons already. Anybody else? God is talking to you tonight. Anybody else? 
I saw your hand. Thank you. You can let it down. Anybody else? If I didn't see your hand yet, just raise it up. Let me see your hand. Tonight is your night of salvation. Anybody else? Don't let the devil steal from you one more day. Not being able to sleep peacefully tonight and just not being sure. Why don't you make sure tonight? As a matter of fact, you know, the devil is trying to tell you, well, why don't this old man just shut up? I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you because God wouldn't leave you alone. He loves you so much. He wants you to respond tonight. Anybody else? Let me see your hand. Anybody? Anybody? Well, let's give God praise for three wise people in the house. Hallelujah. Praise God. Congratulations. Best decision of your entire life. Now listen, here's what we're going to do. In a moment, all of us are going to stand and we're going to give you a shout and a cheer because we are so happy with you. But uh, as we do, I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come meet me in the front here because tonight we're going to pray with you and tonight is your night of salvation. So everybody, please stand. Bring all your stuff. Come up front. And if you're number four, number five, you haven't, it's not too late. Just come. Just come. You ready? Come on. Come on. I can't contain and I Hallelujah. I want Thank more you, Lord. of you, God. Tonight's your night. I want more of you, God. Let me you shake your hand. I'm fire down in my soul that I can't contain oh, and I can't control. Come on I up. Come on up. more of you, God. Because I want Come on up. Come on up. You, God. So set a fire down Praise God. They're in coming. They're coming. That I can't contain Thank you, Lord. and I can't control. Hallelujah. I I'm want right more here. I'm of right you, here. God, because I want more of you, God. God bless you, my friend. Come on up, come on up. Praise God. Anybody else? Anybody else? Tonight's your night. Wow. Give me such peace in your heart tonight. Tonight's your night. Congratulations. Shake me. Shake my hand. Congratulations, okay? Jesus loves you more than you can ever imagine. I want you to know that, all right? Praise God. Now listen, put a smile on your face. You are ready to celebrate because now your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But you don't get saved just because you raise your hand. You have to come and invite Jesus to come into your heart, okay? So what we're going to do is, this is Pastor Joel waving at you. He's going to take you in a room back there just quickly. He's going to pray with you. He's going to give you some free information, some little booklets our pastors have written just to help you to understand what you've just done what you just did, and also to, uh, you know, help you to grow in your walk with God quickly. So no weird stuff, okay? I'm as weird as it gets up here, but he's cool. So if you will just take a left turn, follow Pastor Joel. Let's uh, give God a praise as they go out. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known 
in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.